muted. Um, so good afternoon. I wanted to take um, today and spend some time talking about some of the quality metrics in healthcare. Literally, we could talk all day about them because they always say uh, we have a lot of data and a lot of metrics, so we have to narrow it down to the few that uh, we can talk about in just a mere hour. Um, we're also going to take some time and talk about um, a change management model that my hospital used to try to change culture and then describe how the, cha the stages of that change model were used to drive performance and accountability. So the movement towards patient safety and healthcare quality really got its start in 1999 after the publication of To Air as Human, Building a Safer Healthcare System. Um, that was put out by the Institute of Medicine, and in that report, it was estimated that up to 98,000 patients die each year from medical errors. Whether that estimate is true or not, we do know the fact is that we put imperfect people into imperfect systems, and that leads to a lot of errors in healthcare. The assertion in that report was that it wasn't that people were bad and that they came to work every day trying to make a mistake. It's that people are good and it's the systems that we have that are bad. So hospitals were charged with really taking deep dives into our processes so that we could deliver safer, higher quality care. So the key there is quality. You know, what is quality? Well, it kind of depends on who you're talking to. You know, perhaps getting quality health care is seeing the doctor riding away and being treated courteously or having the doctor spend a lot of time with you. Someone else might say that it's the extent to which health services are used to improve desired health outcomes in our population. Someone else may say that it's different perspectives on healthcare quality lead to different expectations and different methods. So what we do know is that quality can be defined differently depending on your population and your perspective. So that perspective can be uh, quality from the, the facility perspective, the patients, or the community. So if you look at this picture, you're, at first glance, you may see a picture of an older lady and an older man. And that's one way to view this picture. And that could be the facility's perspective to healthcare quality. So what does healthcare quality mean to a facility? Well, it could mean how well we do with patient satisfaction or safety, our outcomes, are we delivering cost-effective care, is it quality? And goodness knows we have a lot of dashboards in which to judge our quality. But then we take that same picture and we think about it from a patient's perspective and we see a whole different picture, a picture of a man playing a guitar and a lady sitting beside him. So for a patient, their perspective may be something just as simple as, when I come to the hospital, don't hurt me, take good care of me, and be nice to me. And then the same picture, looking at it from the community perspective. Anyone see that lady standing in the doorway or the chalice in the middle in between the two older people's heads? A community looks at health care, and they judge hospitals based on word of mouth, the reputation from friends or family any prior experiences they've had, whether their, their physician has a hospital that they prefer to go to, how satisfied are people. And then some of these publicly reported sites like LeapFrog and Hospital Compare, which we'll talk about shortly. So quality is important, and lately what we've seen is that quality is now defer defined in terms of quality rather than quantity. We used to judge how well healthcare was delivered based on volumes, admissions, how many procedures we did, what our financial books look like. And now that focus has really been shifted. So CMS, or the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, in March of 2010, helped to pass the Affordable Care Act. And really, that catapulted health care reform. There's still a lot of work to be done, but the overall goal was to reduce unsustainable health care costs and improve the quality of health care. A lot of the projects that have moved the U.S. towards that goal focus on the pay for the model. And what pay for performance does is it reimburses providers based on very specific outcomes rather than the historic payment for services provided. 
And then what that allows is that consumers to get the information on the quality of care provided by the different hospitals and providers. So we're going to start by talking about the inpatient quality reporting program. The CMS developed three distinct inpatient programs. Um, the IQR, part pay for performance program, the purpose was to provide consumers with quality information on health care to help them make informed decisions about their health care. It is also intended to drive hospitals and providers towards um, improving quality of inpatient care delivered to the patient by incentivizing them through higher annual payments um, each year. The information that is gathered through each of these programs is then made publicly available through the Hospital Compare website, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. So these three programs that have been phased over the last several years are value, hospital value-based purchasing, the Readmission Reduction Program, and the Hospital Acquired Conditions Reduction Program. And this is where hospitals spend much, much of their time. So the Value-Based Purchasing Program is supposed to be a program that is budget neutral, meaning that it's funded by putting at-risk hospitals um, base operating payments. And so based on a hospital's performance, hospitals can either earn back those dollars at risk, all of it, a portion of it, none of it, or if they do well, they can get a, additional dollars above those at risk. And so that's how they justify that it's budget neutral. Hospitals are evaluated on the quality of their care, how well they adhere to best clinical practices, and patient experiences. The financial incentives are scored on how well hospitals perform on the measures, how well they improve over time, and how consistent they are on their performance. The program started in 2012 with our first payments being affected in 2013. And each year, the amount of money at risk for hospitals has grown incrementally from 1% beginning with fiscal year 2013 to 2% where we are right now will go on to be continue to be 2%. Another thing about this program that is challenging for um, hospitals is that as we progress through the years, the domain weights change. So as we become very good in the red bar on here, which is the core, core measure processes, uh, that the weight of that continues to decline. So we get good in one area and they keep raising the bar so that we have to perfect it in all other areas. It's always keeping us on our toes. For fiscal year 2017, there is much more of a push towards outcome. And um, by 2018, all of our process measures will go away. So the heavy focus now is on outcomes specifically looking at mortalities related to patients that have had um, a heart attack, uh, those that might have heart failure or pneumonia, and their 30-day mortality rate. There also is a very big focus on prevention of hospital-acquired conditions like um, C. diff or MRSA, um, any surgical site infections, and the patient experience how well a patient feels when they come to the hospital that they were communicated with by nurses and doctors, how responsive they thought that the staff was, how well their pain was controlled, how well we taught them about their medication, was the hospital clean and quiet, and overall, how did they weight their hospital, rate our hospital. So all of these things are what is really the focus now um, on value-based purchasing. The next program is the Hospital Readmissions Reduction Program. This is a downside risk pro program only. The best that a hospital can do is to retain full reimbursement by not having excess readmissions. We don't have the ability to earn more money. We're only at risk for losing money. This program evaluates all cause readmissions within 30 days of our patients that are discharged. And they're looking at these categories of patients. Those who have had a heart attack, heart failure, pneumonia, COPD, a total hip or knee replacement, um, cardiac bypass surgery, or a stroke. If those patients get dis discharged and then readmitted within 30 days of discharge, that take, the hospital takes a hit on that. It doesn't matter what the cause is. They could have walked out and gotten hit by a bus. We still take the hit for that. So it is measured by a ratio, and any ratio greater than one is an excess readmission ratio. 
and we are subject up to a 3% reduction in our base payment each year on that. So a lot of efforts go into preventing readmissions and making sure that we provide our patients with the proper resources they need to have a successful discharge at home. And the final program is the Hospital Acquired Conditions Reduction Program. And this is also a downside risk program. And again, the best that a hospital can do is retain full reimbursement by not being in the bottom quartile of the performers nationally. The worst 25% performers re receive a 1% reduction in their annual payment. Now this focuses on what CMS determines to be preventable conditions that should not ever happen in a hospital. And so they have two domains, one which is a composite score of what we call patient safety indicators. When a patient comes into the hospital, they should never get a pressure ulcer. They should never get an infection from an IV tube that was put in one of their um, big venous veins. Um, they should never get a post-op hip fracture or a deep vein thrombosis. Similarly, the other domain is all the infectious processes. Patients should not come in and get a urinary tract infection from having a catheter in or a surgical site infection after having a surgery. They should not be getting MRSA when they come to the hospital or C. diff. So this entire program focuses on preventing um, things in the hospital that should never happen. So that was the inpatient quality reporting program. But the next program that hospitals participate in is an outpatient quality reporting program. And similar to the IQR, hospitals are incentivized by reporting data on standardized outpatient measures of care in order to return, receive their full annual update to their outpatient payment rate. And then again, this hospital's performance is publicly reported. The outpatient measures focus on areas that have a big impact in the community and support national priorities for improved quality and efficiency of care. So again, a lot of a lot of time spent on patients that have heart attacks. How we manage patients that come into the emergency room and have a fracture of one of those long bones in your body and how well we treat their pain. How fast we turn around CT results or MRI results in patients that have stroke. Colonoscopy, how well we're doing with follow-up for those and those that get readmitted after an outpatient colonoscopy. How fast we move patients through our emergency department. And that's why you see all those um, billboards with how, how much wait time it is in a hospital. We need to move our patients in and out and get them the care that they need. And then certain web-based measures that we look at, how well we do with safe surgical practices and administering the flu vaccine and laboratory tests. So those all roll up into the outpatient quality reporting program. So you've heard me talk about how things are publicly reported, but how does a consumer know where to go to find this information? Well, CMS created Hospital Compare, and it was designed to allow consumers to find hospitals and compare different hospitals' performance based on quality of care. The link to Hospital Compare is, is included at the bottom of that slide, but this next slide will give you a little vision of what the home page on it looks like. I went in and picked three hospitals within the Richmond area. Um, my hospital is in Rico, St. Mary's, and the Medical College downtown. And if you look across the top tabs, you get a general information, um, but then you're able to go into some of those measures that I just spoke about so that a consumer can rate our, compare our performance with those of our competitors. Something new that CMS came up with uh, and it was just released in the last few weeks, is something called the Overall Hospital Quality Star Rating. This was developed by CMS to allow consumers a very quick summary rating of each hospital using information that they've compiled from both the inpatient and outpatient quality reporting programs. Hospitals are scored from one star to five stars based on their performance in those measures, with five stars being the best. And you can see, again, all those measures in those little purple boxes are the same ones that we talked about in both the in and outpatient quality reporting program. So as it put it on a bell curve, about 48% of the hospitals nationwide have three stars. Um, just a mere 3% have five stars, 25% have four, 20% have two, and 4% have one star. 
So that's kind of the CMS pay for performance program. But hospitals have a just a variety of different areas in which quality metrics are reported. Um, it kind of depends on the services that we provide. Some of the ones that have been in the news and a little bit more public lately are um, the LeapFrog survey, um, hospital safety score where hospitals are given an actual letter grade as to their performance. Um, but then if you have a hospital that um, provides bariatric surgery, you may have quality metrics that you need to um, report for those as well. Many of the insurance companies also have a lot of um, distinction services or um, specialty care services. Um, Anthem is one, um, Aetna is one, and, and they just go on and on. We have uh, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons for those hospitals that do um, heart surgery or the American College of Cardiology for those hospitals that do um, cardiac cath. So you really, I could speak all day about all the different um, metrics we have, but the point is it's endless. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about our story. You know, we thought at Henrico Doctors Hospital that we were doing great. We had numerous awards, accreditations, certifications, and accolades. But as I started off uh, this presentation, it all comes back to perception. There's our same little couple with all the different ways that you can see. And just because we thought we were doing really good didn't really mean that we were, because it's all a matter of perspective. So our epiphany came when we saw a report on Consumer Reports. And as we, we thought we were awesome, but Consumer Reports really didn't. Now, those of us in healthcare would kind of debate whether the metrics used in um, consumer reports were accurate, but it really didn't matter what we thought because it was out for the public to see. So once we saw this, we had our epiphany. We realized that it wasn't just about the dashboard. It was about perception and that we needed to make sure that we were building an enterprise that was set up to change with our different priorities and upcoming changes. Simply put, we needed to set ourselves up for success. So how are we going to bring our facility to that place? Uh, we know change is hard and is often met with resistance and takes time. But we began using the Cotter's eight-step process, and that's how we started our journey. So as we go through each stage, um, stage one is where we needed to establish a sense of urgency. We needed to look at what the potential crisis was, and we needed to get buy-in from at least 75% of our management team that the situation we were in was unacceptable. Pursuing change is less risky than maintaining the status quo. Our competitors were going to pass us by if we didn't continue to move in the direction we needed. So we needed to really work hard and build motivation, involvement, and support. So we did that by checking out all our data, looking at all the reports, looking at the consumer reports, um, sharing all the data with stakeholders, and creating an understanding and buy-in at all levels of the organization. You don't need to know what all of this means to know that there's a lot of red on our data. So where we thought we were this great, really turned out we were just this great. So we needed to move on. So the risks of stage one is to, to fail to establish a great enough sense of urgency and under, underestimating the difficulty of moving people out of their comfort zone. It's hard to change. Um, and then sometimes getting into that um, area, into the zone of moving people, um, is difficult. And if you underestimate that or get overwhelmed by that, you'll get yourself uh, stuck. Stage two is forming a powerful coalition. We had to form a strong team. We had to make sure that we focused on teamwork and we gathered a, a strong leadership team. If we didn't have all the right players, our, our boat was going to capsize. And so we really needed to get everyone on board as a foundation of our clinical excellence. So at Henrico, we structured, restructured all of our old processes and people we really focused on teamwork and eliminated silos and worked on our team process. So just within my own department, we brought in a chief medical officer and restructured with my position and my department so that we had all the key places, all the key people in place. The risk of this stage is maintaining a hierarchy where you know it's not working 
um, but keeping it on because it's just too difficult to change. Um, the, also, another risk is not having strong line managers. You really need to get people in there that um, are bought into the, the teamwork so that they don't undervalue the work that's being done. Stage three is creating a vision. You know, visions need to be clear and appealing, and they need to be able to speak to the organization. John Cotter said that if you can't communicate the vision to someone in five minutes or less and get a reaction that signifies that you both understand, then you're not at where you need to be with your vision. So we developed our vision. Our vision was quality drives our culture, and we want perfect care 100% of the time. So the risks of stage three is making a plan that is too complicated to be useful and not establishing a vision, but putting many plans and programs into place. So once you have your vision, then you need to communicate your vision. And you have to have strategies to get that communication. In a large organization such as ours, communication is tough. We're spread over three campuses and two freestanding emergency centers. We have about 1,200 medical staff over 2,000 employees, and it's really hard to communicate. So we had to come up with new communication techniques, and we also had to make sure that this newly restructured leadership team was walking the walk. <clears throat> so we shared our vision. We did communication um, with all of our medical and clinical staff and encouraged them to be involved, and we knew, used new ways to communicate. We had town hall meetings. We have a weekly publication called The Pulse that comes out. We have daily huddles and team meetings, and we have um, several fun events that we did. Um, this is an example of The Pulse that comes out and the CEO's message, so that when we have something important, um, he puts it on there. We try to have it read more like a people magazine rather than um, a, a healthcare journal, because we think more people are apt to pick up a people magazine than a healthcare journal. Uh, we also did a video which really united the hospital. It was um, the happy video. And every department that wanted to participate participated in this video, and it was really brought the, the hospital together. Risk of stage four is lack of credible communication. Again, if you can't overcome the challenges of communication, which we face every day, you're really not going to um, attack the stage very well. Um, also, failure to walk the walk and um, failure to communicate the whys of what you're doing. Stage five is empowering others to act on your vision. Eliminating your, op your obstacles and get rid of the simple stuff first. Empowering people and changing your systems and structures that are there simply to undermine the vision. And then you've got to encourage people to take risks and come up with new ideas, activities, and actions. So some of the ways that we empowered our team were through daily huddles. We developed a nursing shared governance, which was new for us, where nursing, bedside nursing gets in and really has a leadership organization, um, and, and they represent themselves in the hospital. We restructured our three campuses so that what was important at one campus that wasn't necessarily important at another campus, it allowed us all to focus on what was important to us. We had a lot of policy changes. We also, what was big, is we shared our results. We have unit-based scorecards for every unit in our hospital so that they individually can own their own data. And then in our, in our daily huddle, we have something each day that we start with um, in terms of kind of inspirational sayings that we start each morning with. So for the risks of stage five, or if you fail to remove the people that are in place that have the power and they resist the change and you don't get rid of them, you're going to undermine your effort. And then the other risk is if there are inconsistencies between your actions and the overall effort. So stage six, which is the stage that I think we're currently at at Henrico Doctors, is where we plan for and create short-term wins. Here we develop our clear performance improvement goals and measurement systems and reward when goals are achieved. We also maintain commitments to achieve those short-term goals and a high urgency level and force people to think deeply so that they can maintain our goals and clarify our vision. So again, we want to plant the seed. Um, we don't want to just uh, give them a fish. We want to teach them how to fish. 
Um, but creating the short-term wins, we had to show it to people. Here's what we've done. And this is just a quick slide where we shared how well we perform with other hospitals in the Richmond area. So if a risk of stage two, if you don't celebrate your short-term wins, people will give up or they'll be with those that resist the change. And if you do not define your short-term goals, those urgency levels can drop. So stage seven, and again, this is where I think we're kind of moving to, is consolidating improvements and producing more change. So we need use, use increased credibility from your earlier wins to change the old way we used to do things around there. Understand that these efforts take not just months, but often years. And then when you're thinking about who you're going to bring in, you promote or you hire or you develop employees that are behind your program and who can implement the vision you set forth. So after a few years of hard work, managers may be tempted to declare victory with the first clear performance improvement. While celebrating a win is fine, declaring the war one can be catastrophic. And those go into the risks of stage seven. If you declare victory before the changes have really sunk into our culture, then you're, you're shortchanging yourself. Premature victory celebrations instead of short-term wins will also often kill the ongoing momentum. And then again, allowing the resistors to take over. Finally, stage eight is institutionalizing new approaches. Communicate frequently how the new approaches, behaviors, and attitudes have improved performance. And create leadership development programs and succession planning that are consistent with your new approach. Change sticks when it becomes the way we do things around here. So the risks to stage eight are new behaviors not rooted in our social norms and values, not ensuring that those coming behind us understand that transformation has taken place, and poor secession development will often um, kind of become an obstacle into your renewal efforts. So I hope that was helpful. That was um, kind of the journey we took as we looked at um, the approach of really raising the quality within our institute. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. So thanks, Denise, for your presentation. It was very informative. Um, if anybody has any questions, um, please uh, put your questions into the chat box, and we'll, uh, we'll take uh, those questions as they come. So, Denise, it looks like our first question is, can we have a copy of the presentation? Sure, yes. I'll probably, now, yeah, actually, I was going to think I'd say, there might be one data slide I'm going to take out, but the rest you can have. Okay. Uh, second question, uh, do you have a patient survey program, and how does it work? Yes, so um, if you reflect back on what I was talking about, patient satisfaction, what is required to participate in the inpatient quality reporting program is um, the administration of which they call the HCAP survey. And that's developed by CMS and goes through all those elements that I mentioned in terms of cleanliness, communication, medication. Each hospital can pick a vendor that they can use to administer that survey. Um, we use Press Ganey. Um, additionally, that's for the inpatient. Um, there are outpatient surveys, so we have satisfaction data for um, those patients that are considered outpatients that are here for less than 24 hours, uh, those that come in for tests and treatment, um, behavioral health, we do have a behavioral health center, um, our emergency department satisfaction as well. None of those at this point, other than the inpatient ones, are publicly reported, um, but Press Ganey, um administers all of our satisfaction surveys. So we have another question here. I'm just trying to get to a place where we can read it. Um, mm -hmm. All right. Is it possible to meet your metrics and still not get the behavior that you want or change customer perceptions? What thought was given to structuring the metrics? So. Yes. Can you meet the metrics? Yes. Um, 
Denise and her team can run around and make sure that every metric is met. <laughs> um, but the thought was uh, really to change the culture in our facility. We really needed people to understand why this is important. And it's not about the money. It's not about the financial um, incentives. It's really about giving the patients the quality care. And so as we approached all of this, and it did start back in those slides with really the quality department running around trying to meet all the metrics. But then it really moved into partnering with our nurse leaders and our physician leaders so that this was second nature to them and it was how we do things around here. So the thought went from this being a quality department challenge to this being part of doing business at Henrico Doctors Hospital. Not about the money, but about the patient care. And we still, you know, we, it's a constant work in progress. As you saw, our, our priorities change over years. Um, but it's really embedding it into the people at the bedside so they know that this is the best care and this is what's best for the patient. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Okay. So the next question is, to what extent did lean methodologies play a part in your quality improvement efforts? Uh, we use lean a lot in terms especially of evaluating some of those processes that were just really laden with a lot of wasted efforts and time. Um, I can say early on especially, there were a good deal of projects where we just reevaluated every heavy process to see what things we could get rid of um, to eliminate the waste of time, um, the waste of motion, um, and the waste of energy. Uh, probably not as much now, but early on, because we've gotten a lot of our processes and our approaches um, more refined. Um, but early on, we relied heavily on a lot of those lean processes. So it looks like the next question is, did you define additional metrics? Oh, yeah, so uh, tons of metrics. Um, we, I could speak to them for pretty much every department we have. Um, you know, if I think about our operating room, uh, we define metrics there in terms of um, case start times, turnaround times in the room, um, how fast we turn over our, um, our, our trays that we use in surgeries and the quality of those trays. Um, I, again, I could go on and on. We look at um, cardiac surgery and how fast we get patients off of the ventilator so we don't put them at risk for pneumonia. These are things that are not publicly reported but really keep us to a higher level. Um, so again, it depends on the services that a facility offers. Um, and if I went through every service line, we could certainly go through um, every different metric that we look at. Um, people will often say we're data rich and information poor. So we probably have more data than we even know what to do with um, in a lot of situations. Um, I literally just touched on the ones that were most, um, I guess, out there in terms of people knowing the most about it because of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and a lot of it is, is tied to reimbursement. But some of these other metrics, while not being publicly reported, for example, might drive business towards us. So if we have certain um, distinctions, it will drive insurance companies to push their patients toward us. So metrics, every department, every service line. So the next question, how hard was it getting doctors on board with this initiative? It seems that they might have their own ideas on how to do things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that was probably one of the most challenging. And I will say, um, in the slide where I talked about the restructuring of just my department, and I just put a snapshot, bringing in a chief medical officer was crucial to our change. Um, our chief medical officer had been a community-based physician and then had more recently been in charge of our hospitalist group. So the people knew him, the physicians knew him, respected him, and it was a lot easier for him to talk peer-to-peer -to -peer with the physicians than it was for Denise or her people to talk uh, to the physician. You got a lot more buy-in. 
Plus, as we start to get some of these younger physicians in, they're already learning a lot of this in medical school. And we used a lot of peer pressure, a lot of um, sharing of data, a lot of um, peer evaluation in order to bring them on board. And I have to say, I, I've been in this role for about three and a half years, but I've been at this hospital for 20. And the amount of change in the last five years has been tremendous in terms of the medical staff. They really have shifted. Um, you're going to still have those resistors. They're the, usually the ones that make the most noise, but they are by far the um, smallest volume. Okay, our next question is, how many sacred cows were sacrificed during this change? Well, I don't know that I have a number. And um, hmm, a few. <laughs> um, and I wouldn't say they were sacrificed. Um, if they were resistant, and uh, my boss will say you can, you either can do it and need some education, or you can't, don't want to do it. And if your vision doesn't align with our vision, then it's not a good fit. So there were some people that met that criteria, um, and and that's okay. So we did lose a few, but it was sometimes the fear of losing somebody that's been rooted here for a long time is. Um, it's so strong, and once you really uh, realize that you need to push past that barrier, you're, you're much better off on the other side. Okay, so the next question, how is this data used to evaluate purchasing decisions about the value of new clinical systems or equipment? Hmm. Uh, probably the value-based purchasing programs um, we spend a lot of time working on those disease processes within them. Um, as far as clinical systems, you know, it's a much broader picture than just the value-based purchasing and the metrics. There we're going to start to see, you know, what brings us the highest margin, um, what investment will, for example, um, we know our women's and children's services um, give us our highest return. So we're in the midst of a you know, $35 million renovation in our women's pavilion. So the data we get from those um, services really drive where our investments are. Um, in addition to those high-risk services that we know um, put us at risk of um, not delivering good quality care, uh, those we also re sink our resources into as well. All right, thanks, Denise. I guess uh, I think we're going to open up the mic, see if anybody else wants to uh, or has any other questions, um, and uh, go from there. So all the mics have been unmuted, so if anybody else has any um, questions for Denise. It looks like we do have a question in the chat box. Um, it says, uh, in my experience, in having strong executive support slash sponsorship is key. Do you have any examples of visible action slash decisions made by the hospital president that help demonstrate that we are serious about the need to change this time? Yeah. Um, about the same time as our Chief Medical Officer and I both started in this role, we had a change in CEOs. Our, our CEO um, retired and we brought in a new CEO. And he likes to say that people pay attention to what their bosses pay attention to. Um, and certainly he had a very strong focus on quality and culture. And he really built his leadership team around that focus. <clears throat> and with that, he was certain that this vision of quality care was spread throughout the organization. And it needs to start with leadership. And when I speak of leadership, I don't just mean of the administrative team. Um, the amount of information that is given to the Board of Trustees on quality and metrics and our future and where we're heading is um, 
has expanded exponentially from where we were five years ago. Quality is a standing agenda item, and he has really coached this team into really leading the hospital in the, that direction, and that, that is a big change. Um, there is never a time where quality is not on the agenda of any strategic planning meeting, um, of any report to corporate, of any report to medical executive committee. Um, it has become a regular standing item. Um, and I think his approach to all of that and his approach to team building um, and sharing that vision is really what helped us get in the direction we needed to get in. All right, thank you very much. Um, nobody else has any more questions. I think we'll conclude the presentation. I want to thank Denise for uh, taking the time out of her day today to give us this, uh, this very informative webinar. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.